everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up, and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold him, who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord, and if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our brother Brant. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until, by your call, we are reunited with those who have gone before, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the appointed lesson. A reading from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me, he has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wonderful for me. It is so high. 
A reading from the 8th chapter of Romans. All who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it's that very spirit that witnesses to our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with Him, that we might also be glorified with Him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Who is to condemn us? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who intercedes for us at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress, persecution or famine, nakedness, peril of the sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. <coughs> Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. deeply loved him. After a period of reflection since the time of his death, we gather now to affirm together why we loved him. To remember as a community of faith and friends, what was it that made him special? What made us so fond of him? What are the things about him we would want his grandchildren and great-grandchildren to know and remember. There are several that we could list. I will limit myself to just four. Reflect with me. Tell me, these ring true for you. I believe that Grant's most exceptional trait was that he was a man of uncommon tenderness, tenderhearted. He was not a harsh man. He was a hugger, not a shout. <laughs> he was just, but never legalistic. Many of you would choose different words to describe this part of him, his heart for others. Some of you would say compassionate, some generous, but we're talking about the same thing. He felt the pain of others in an uncommon way. He wept with your weeping. He rejoiced in your rejoicing. One clear example of that came in April 1977. I had a very significant job offer that every vein and prideful bone in my body wanted to accept. But it was going to demand a truly enormous amount of time away from home. I knew in prayer that with three young sons and with a fourth on the way, I had to turn down this very lucrative job. Well, as soon as Kim and I made that difficult decision, I, the first call I needed to make was to mom and dad. On that phone call, it hit me how badly I had wanted to accept this prestigious position. And I found myself weeping uncontrollably on the phone. I was literally heaving for breath as the Lord painfully ungrafted from my flesh the vain part of me that wanted that job and the acclaim that would come with it. To my dying day, I will never forget my mom and dad weeping with me over the phone. Tell me, friend, when did someone last weep for you when you called them on the phone? When did you last weep with someone when they called you? Truly, I believe my dad was a man of uncommon tenderness. I loved him. I believe we loved him because he was tender. 
That story about giving up a job in order to be a better dad for my four sons rang especially true with Brands. In 1967, Dad was in a long-standing and successful career in sales for Freeport Kaler, but it involved traveling all over the country for the vast majority of his time. Dad had just had his fourth son, Chris, and came to the conclusion that he needed a career that would keep him close to home. He also wanted to become more involved in local politics and to pursue an interest in acting that he had. And so for all those reasons, he made a courageous decision to give up a safe and secure career in the paper business in order to go into real estate here in Macon. Now you might think that the Lord would bless that sort of righteous decision with financial manna. <laughs> <laughs> but he did. In fact, that righteous choice was to the detriment of Dad's financial prosperity. But it paid dividends in a far more eternal currency. It led directly to his coming to Christ. And because of his new career kept it, keeping him in Macon, he was much more available and involved in our lives and, of course, with Jan. And it allowed him, especially after we got older, to pursue his passions, first for local politics and then theater. Many of you are well aware of the many, many stage plays in which he performed. Dad poured himself into those roles and was never more fully alive than when he was on stage. I really admire a man who has and pursues a passion. Brant was not some bump on a log who watched football games and lived in a life of leisure with his friends. He was intently engaged in the passions of first politics and then the theater and then ultimately writing short stories. My favorite of the short stories is called 39 Steps. Uh, you've, you've heard the expression that an alcoholic has to hit rock bottom before he can get better. Well, 39 Steps is the funny story of Brant finally hitting rock bottom over the issue of his weight. It's named for the 39 steps in a spiral staircase at a lodge where we stayed together when Brant and Jan came out to visit us one hot Texas summer. Brant was in his 60s and was at his all-time heaviest at that point. And as a result, he was feeling especially self-conscious about the difficulty he was having in climbing the 39 steps in this spiral staircase. Kim and I had invited Brant and Jan out to this lodge for a Bible study retreat that we were attending. And the Lord evidently had it in his mind that he was going to work on Brant's weight issue that week. <laughs> Well, one afternoon, Brant decided to come swimming with me out in the river that run alongside this lodge. And out in the middle of this river, there was a, a floating swimming dock made from eight 55-gallon drums strapped together with a wood top and some outdoor carpeting over them so you could go out there and sunbathe or climb up on it and dive off of it and just enjoy the river. Well. They had swum out there, and uh, there was this kind of typical metal swim ladder on the side of this thing, so he could climb up on it and get out there. And he pulls up to this, you know, pretty enormous floating dock and starts to climb up the ladder to, to take a breather after having swum out there. You know, he's in his sixties. Well, he may have been the largest human that ever tried to get up on that thing. <laughs> He found that when he grabbed the ladder and then put his foot on the bottom rung, this thing just raised my head. <laughs> <laughs> the try as he made, he could not get up on that thing. Oh my, the Lord really got his attention in that moment. And it launched him on a path toward finally losing a lot of weight, over 100 pounds. Brant redeemed that experience by writing a funny story about hitting the bottom on the side of a floating dock. <laughs> Brant was really engaged in his passions of politics, the theater, and writing, and I really admire a man who pursues his passion. So I think we've got a strong case that Brant Frost was a man of uncommon tenderness who pursued his passions. 
The third thing I believe we can safely say about Brandt is that he was a man of integrity, a man of honor. Everyone will tell you that they believe in integrity, honor, and doing the right thing. But Brandt did it. I'm not going to say more about that other than to tell you these vignettes because they speak for themselves. It was Christmas 1977. I was home from college playing on a golf scholarship and I was a freshman and spent the semester as a running buddy to a senior on the golf team who I was looking up to for all the wrong reasons. So I came home Christmas, first semester, <coughs> talking about Ken, this new role model of mine, and I tell my dad, Dad, this senior on the golf team, Ken, when he, uh, when he gets new tires for his car, he takes the receipt and gives it to his dad. His dad's a doctor. The doctor's got a medical practice, and the doctor writes it off on his income taxes for the medical practice. So I thought you might have all these receipts for the of my car. <laughs> well, you would have thought I told him he should call back, because he wasn't going to have none of that at all. He was, he was swift and simple. He said, Frost, do not do that. That's dishonest, it's cheating, and you're never going to get ahead being dishonest and cheating. For me, it was a searing moment in what it means to be Frost. Another example, and this one blends the, the doing the right thing, integrity part, with his generous side. Sometime back in the 80s, there was a realtor in town named E.Y. Stokes. He's in the room today. Well, old E.Y. was busting his chops trying to sell a small shopping center to this buyer he had from India. And I mean, E.Y. was working this thing to death, trying to get this buyer to the table. He'd invested a ton of time in the deal over a very long period. And at this point, E.Y. and Brandt didn't know each other. Well, Brandt and his business partner, Tommy Alexander, who's also in the room today, uh, they came up with another buyer for this little shopping center. And they take him to closing, and, and once all the papers get signed, the seller, who was from a well-known family in town, had a, had a little chuckle and said to Tommy and Brandt, man, that E.Y. E. Stokes is going to be sick as a dog when he hears he sold this place because he had worked it so hard. And the seller went on to tell how hard he lied and worked on selling this little shopping center that Brant and Tommy had just closed. Well, Brant talks to Tommy, and they had the closing agent take $500 out of their commission and uh, send it to EY. Now, that was back in $500, real money. They had no obligation at all, really, legal or moral, to do that. They just did it because they knew that what that type of disappointment was like. Well, you know why he gets the envelope in the mail, he opens it up, no self-congratulatory letter in there, or anything, just $500 check from Tommy and Brandon. <laughs> but EY said, I had folks grab $500 out of my feet before, but I've never met a man who would add $500. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, years later, EY was uh, moving his real estate practice from one agency to another, and the first place he called was Alexander Cross. That was 1990, and E.Y. and Brandt went on to become devoted colleagues and dear friends to Dad's dying day. Well, so far we've concluded that Brandt was a man of tenderness who pursued his passions and who knew how to do the right thing with integrity and all that. The fourth and final aspect of his life was his faith. It underpinned all the others. <coughs> Although he was not raised in a church going home, he married in one. And Jan and her mom were really instruments that God used to draw him into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. After many years of attending church with mom, dad ultimately came into a saving relationship at a Faith Alive weekend held right here on this campus in the early 1970s. That faith forever transformed him and reshaped him. It manifested itself in a deep and tender faithfulness to my mom that only improved with age. It was an inspiration to each of us. He became a, a man of faithfulness to many, to his sons, the nieces and nephews of his divorced sister, <clears throat> the many communi communities that he nurtured, 
here at St. Francis and in, and in its ministries, in the theater, in the real estate business, Frank was not just a faithful friend. He was a man of faith. He ended most conversations with the parting words, the peace of the Lord be with you. Well, I'll close today with my favorite story, Brant. One that you've almost certainly not heard because Brant didn't speak of it often. He was too hard <coughs> to tell it much. The public schools here in Macon were desegregated in 1965-66. In those early years of desegregation, one of the football stars at the formerly all-white Lanier High School was an African-American named Calvin Hicks. He was a poised and soft-spoken man. He came to marry a lovely wife and successfully obtained his Georgia real estate license. Well, in the early 1970s, you could have all the licenses you want. But if you were black, you were not a member of the Macon Board of Realtors, which at the time was an all-white organization, reflecting the fact that all the prominent real estate agencies in town were still all-white. Well, Calvin was just looking for a job. And he heard about my dad and came to him and asked him and Tommy to give him a chance. Tommy and Brad talked it over and agreed that it was the right thing to do. So they hired him. So Calvin seats up for work and comes to the office, to the office, this proud, accomplished man of proven ability. He walks into my dad's corner office that first day. He's got in his hand this MLS book has all the listings of all the houses for sale in the entire city. You know what the first words out of his mouth were to my dad? Which ones can I sell? Which ones can I sell? Let those words sink in a minute. Put yourself in Calvin's skin for a moment. <coughs> what was Calvin really asking? He was asking, would black families in Macon who were prospering and wanted to find better homes and schools for their kids, would they have the same chance that white families had to move out of poor neighborhoods and into better ones? He was asking, do you believe, do you really believe the words of our nation's Declaration of Independence? that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You get very few moments like that in life. Moments where no matter what you say about your values, the truth about your values is instantly revealed. It was a historic question. Which ones can I say? How would you have responded? Would you have hedged? Would you have hesitated? My dad's answer was short and simple. He said, Calvin, it's in the book. You can sell it. Calvin went on to be one of the most successful agents in the history of Alexander Frost. <coughs> Tommy and Brandt went on to sponsor Calvin for membership in the Making Board of Builders. And he became its first black member. As, as a result of that courageous work by all of them, which exemplified the highest ideals of <coughs> our nation and our faith, making us a better place to be. <coughs> I am proud of my dad for that. So there you have it. We loved him because he was tender. We were drawn to him because of his faith. We admired him because he was a man who pursued his passion. And we respected him because he was a man who did the right thing. Many of you will have remembrances and funny stories that you would like to share. <coughs> Jan and the entire family would like to hear every one of them. We have two of Brant's grandchildren who are serving in the reception as roving reporters, videotaping any message <laughs> or remembrance that you would like to share 
with Jan. And we'll edit all of that into a DVD for her. And uh, we'd love for your smiling faces to be, to be a part of that. If you think you have a memorable story to share, please seek out Katie Frost and Jonathan Frost, who will be in the reception. Don't be shy. <laughs> for myself, my mom, my brothers Brant, Ben, and Chris, for the entire family, thank you for loving my dad. And from my big daddy, I leave you with the peace of the Lord. Amen. Amen.
family of uh, Brian and Jan. I'm not unaware that many of them grew up here in this parish. As noted on the front of your bulletin, our burial rite in the Episcopal Church reflects the Easter liturgy. It finds all its meaning in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Life has not ended, but only changed. After this service, uh, there is a reception in the parish hall. Uh, we'll ask you, to, after the dismissal hymn, to go out these doors and sort of go slowly toward the parish hall because they need, there's an overflow crowd in the parish hall. And so they need a little bit of time to rearrange the seating and tables in there for the reception. So we will make it there eventually, but not directly, I guess. <laughs> um, also, in just a few minutes, we'll be celebrating communion. There's a, a, a page in your bulletin about communion and taking communion in the Episcopal Church. I want you to know that... All are welcome at God's table. If you have never taken communion in this church, in the Episcopal Church or any other church before, I invite you forward to God's table. Don't worry about how you should do it. We will get you fed. <laughs> <laughs> Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being.
And when our mortal body lies in death, there is prepared for us a dwelling place eternal in the heavens. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is alive. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and that the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask for your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise. Forever and ever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. For thine is the kingdom and the power. 
Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let's be the peace. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Almighty God, we thank you in your great love. You have fed us with spiritual food and drink the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and have given us the glory of your heaven and heaven. Grant that this sacrament may be with us a comfort and affliction, and a pledge to our inheritance in that kingdom where there is no death, neither sorrow nor crying, but the fullness of joy. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be God.